Welcome to the Derek Diamond Experience Podcast, where every week I take a look into the world of film and television with those who have lived it and experienced it. I am your host, Derek Diamond, and today you'll be hearing my conversation with actor, writer, and director Miles Doliak, who recently wrote and directed his fifth feature film, The Dinner Party, which I had the pleasure of watching earlier this week. And it was interesting because I didn't get to watch the film until after I did the interview with Miles. So it was interesting having that kind of behind the scenes knowledge of it before actually watching the film. And as I've mentioned on previous episodes of the show, I was a huge fan of the film Knives Out that came out late last year. It was actually my favorite movie of 2019. So in the conversation that I had with Miles, I was picturing something similar to Knives Out with it taking place primarily in a singular location, having that ensemble cast that I love, which we talk about uh, in the interview. And what I saw with The Dinner Party, it took the murder mystery slash ensemble genre and completely turned it on its head because it goes in directions that, that you would not even think that it would go. And it honestly surprised me but it was a surprise in a good way because that's what I like about movies is I like to just strap in and go along for the ride and I thought the location was beautiful it was in this kind of upscale uh, southern home in Mississippi I thought the cast played off each other very well which is crucial uh, in a film like that where you build it around an ensemble cast and I actually enjoyed the directions that the story went because it kept me on the edge of my seat. It surprised me because I could never quite guess where it was going to go. And there is a very interesting religious twist at the end that I won't spoil for those uh, who haven't seen it because if you're listening to this interview the day it comes out, then uh, the film will just be uh, being released on uh, streaming services. So I highly recommend that everyone watch it. It's a very fun movie. But even if you're not a fan of horror or suspense films, I recommend you check it out because it's very well made. The cast was great. It was shot beautifully. Location was great. I personally really enjoyed the movie. And hopefully you guys will check it out after hearing this podcast. And real quick, before we do get started with the interview, I did want to say uh, there will be some tweaks coming to the podcast uh, for those who have been longtime listeners, definitely stay tuned for the outro of the show, and I will explain those changes uh, that will be happening over the next couple of weeks. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Miles Doliak. Happy to be joined with my special guest this week, actor, writer, director, and teacher, Miles Doliak. How are you, sir? I'm well, sir. How are you? Doing good. We were actually just talking uh, before we started recording. Uh, You're from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, which actually isn't too terribly far uh, from where I live in Pensacola. And it's it's pretty rare because most, uh, you know, actors, directors, whoever I talk to are normally based out of New York or Los Angeles, so... It's nice to be talking to somebody who's from a little bit closer. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Um, you know, growing up in Mississippi uh, was really a huge thing for me and a huge part of my creative development. And I had the good fortune in high school to take a course called Mississippi Writers uh, with a man named Mike Tebow, who is still teaching as, as far as I know, uh, where we read the works of... William Faulkner and Tennessee Williams and Eudora Welty and Richard Wright and Shelby Foote and all these amazing Mississippi authors. And I can certainly say that that their influence is profound in what I do now. So, uh, you know, growing up in Mississippi was was a was certainly a net positive for me. Yeah. And I think it gets a little bit overlooked on the you know great quality of work that does come from the South, not just writing, but also in film. And I think that's prevalent because, well, before the whole COVID crisis happened, you were hearing about projects in New Orleans, in Atlanta, you know, really a, a lot of major locations in the South. So I, I feel like now it's getting a little bit more of the credit as far as a, a location goes. Because uh, there are some great places around here to to shoot movies, from beaches to wooded areas to metropolitan areas. 
I think the South's a great place to to film movies. Oh, no doubt. So much geographic and architectural diversity, uh, for sure. And uh, all of my features have been shot in Mississippi. And I've really been impressed uh, with what we've been able to accomplish from a location perspective. Because, uh, of course, some of those films are set in Mississippi and some of them are not. Um, and we've needed sort of urban cityscape vibe, you know, we've needed incredibly rural kind of, um, locations. We've needed super small town mom and pop pick a pack type locations. We've needed upscale bars and we have been able to more or less find all of those locations, uh, shooting in Mississippi. And then of course, for the the, the latest one, the dinner party, we needed this um, ornate mansion uh, that is the home of Dr. Carmine Braun, and, and we found that right there in Hattiesburg, Mississippi as well, thanks to Dr. and Mrs. Carr McLean. So uh, shout out to those guys. Uh, that, that location really, really served us well. So for anyone who's an aspiring filmmaker who might be listening to this, the South is a great location to film your movie. You should definitely come down here. But it's not just also the the locations, but I've discovered, and, I, and I'm, I, don't, I don't want to speak for you when I say this, but from my personal experience, especially over the last, I think, two to three years, I've really seen a surge in the creative aspect of that, whether it's acting, people who are writing, wanting to direct, or heck, even you know to be PAs and grips. Like I've seen a surge of people in this area who want to be in the filmmaking industry. Like it was around a little bit, you know, like five or six years ago when I first really started to get involved with the filmmaking community. And we have a a fantastic one, you know, here in Pensacola and we do like monthly meet and greets where we get to talk about projects we're working on, what we need help with. And it's, it's run extremely well. And, And it's really cool to see that, you know, in this type of an area. Yeah, I think there's so much potential in the Southeast, and uh, we've seen that come to fruition really in Atlanta and with the Marvel films being there, Pinewood Studios, and um, and New Orleans too, Baton Rouge to a lesser extent. I mean, I was here in New Orleans in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, um, and I was getting my PhD at Tulane University, and all this production started exploding, and, and Hollywood invested in South Louisiana. And, you know, you're seeing major, major shows being shot here, HBO and A&E and um, big time studio movies. And um, and that that really gave me a kind of springboard to be able to do uh, what I'm doing now. And that is, you know, continuing a, 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 a pretty decent career, I suppose, as an actor and then getting to do my own thing uh, and make my own films. and. Uh, the other thing that is happening is that it, it really has become this melting pot for independent filmmaking. And it was independent filmmakers who really inspired me at the starting gate to start making my own films, seeing the work that they were doing um, there on the ground and saying, you know what, uh, we're going to make our own opportunities. And that, that really, really is a powerful thing. And, you know, a guy like Mike Mayhall, who, uh, plays Jeff Duncan in our latest film, The Dinner Party, and also served as the stunt coordinator. He and I go back several years uh, because I was in an independent film that he was making in Covington, Louisiana, called Jake's Road, five, six, seven years ago. And seeing what guys like Mike were doing uh, inspired me to say, hey, you know, let, let's start making our own movies. Um, so, yeah, there's a, there's both a a studio component and a, and a big network component. And there is a, a real, a growing, thriving uh, independent film community in the Southeast as well. And uh, I, I've been very fortunate to be a part of both of those worlds. Well, it's like you said, it's, it's powerful and I think inspiring in a way too, because when you, you know, using yourself as, as an example, when you see people from the area who have success it's motivating in a way to think, you know, you know, they can do it so I can do it too. And then anytime I hear like a friend of mine or someone that 
I know of but may not really know personally, when I see them doing really good work, it's a good motivator and a drive to make me think, okay, I can I can continue to do that too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the things I always tell my students, and you know, as we were talking before uh, we started recording, and I'm a faculty member at Loyola. Uh, the most important thing is that you're creating something, that you're making your films, and it, it can be done. And it can be done whether you have 50 cents or $50 million. And the singular thing that inspired me to start directing, writing, directing, producing my own films was seeing other independent filmmakers at work. Now, I'm not talking about studio folks. I'm not talking about the, you know, the big Hollywood crowd. I'm talking about independent filmmakers who built their films from the ground up, who raised the money, who hired the cast, who probably hired the caterer and the crew and, you know, put the whole thing together from nothing and made a film uh, that then, you know, is now out there in the world. And that's, that's such an impressive thing uh, and, a, and a difficult thing. But the fact that I saw people who were close to me, who were in my sphere of influence and, and my social circle that were doing it, um, that, that really, you know, gave me a kick in the pants to say, Hey, you know, you can do this too. No, absolutely. And I, I was actually watching, uh, you brought up a good point in the sense that, you know, I was watching a, a webinar earlier today and it was about the keys to success. And the number one step is work with what you have. You know, you, you think, you know, you don't need, if you want to make something, you can take an iPhone or Android, wherever you have. And you can make a short with that. I mean, you might have to find, you know, some decent audio gear, but really other than that, and that I encourage people to just create stuff, you know, whether it's a, a short skit that you film with an iPhone or something like that, you're creating and that's, you're building the, the building blocks to ultimately getting to, to where you want to go. No doubt. No doubt. You know, many years ago, I lived in LA for a time and, the thing that struck me being out in Los Angeles was how many people talked about making movies or had a script uh, or, you know, whatever, but very few people were actually making movies. It was this sort of elite crowd, this bubble that no one could seemingly penetrate. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's still true. I mean, it's, it's getting better. I mean, more people are with the advent of all these new technologies and, and anybody you know, not anybody, but a lot of folks can get their hands on a decent camera nowadays, whether that's an iPhone or a black magic camera or whatever it might be. Um, more people have access to the technology than ever. And I think more people are um, feeling emboldened enough, right, to, or brave enough, maybe we should say, to actually make a film. I, I just think that for a long time there, that a lot of people talked about making movies. Very few people actually made movies and that's certainly true in the big sort of meccas of the entertainment industry like los angeles and and new york um but down here in the southeast there there's uh you know there's some gritty ragtag folks who are who are who are saying hey you know uh let's just get the movie made and you know to to hell with the the, the studio money or that you know what the budget might be. Let's, let's make our film our way and see what we can come up with. And, and sometimes you come up with something that that's magical, right? but at the very least uh, you've made a film, you know, and you've got it, you've got a calling card. You, you've got something that you can put out there and say, Hey, this is my vision. This is my voice. This is who I am as a filmmaker. And that's powerful stuff. Absolutely. And I think, you know, kind of going off on what you were saying, I think when this whole COVID crisis is over, because I was talking with somebody about this the other day, I think we're going to see a huge surge in creativity. Because if you think about it, you know, we're all stuck at home. You can still write from home. You can still plan a film from home. So I, I think once a lot of the bans are lifted, we're going to see a huge surge of of independent movies. And I, for one, am really excited about it. Yeah. I, you know, I sure hope so. I mean, film is the ultimate collaborative medium. Right? Absolutely. It, film requ requires a communal effort. And, uh, 
when the cap is off this bottle and, you know, I'm 100% in favor of taking it slow and listening to the experts and, and thinking about our safety and our health first and foremost. Uh, but when the cap is off this thing and we are past this terrible pandemic, I really do very much look forward to seeing uh, what what the film production business is and, and what crazy creative heights uh, we might be able to reach from having so many talented folks sitting at home sort of plotting and, and stewing and reflecting over who they are as artists and, and thinking about their stories and their voices and what, what are the stories that they really want to tell. So I, I agree with you. I think it's going to be a fascinating time creatively. I'm really looking forward to it. But kind of backtracking a little bit, talk with me about what was it that initially made you want to pursue a career in acting and then how did you do it? Uh, well, I've been acting at, at some level since I was probably six or so years old. Um, it's always been something that has just drawn me sort of moth to the flame, like, you know, and I was in school theater and community theater at a very early stage. I loved movies at a very early stage. I'm six years old, 1981 sitting at the old Hardy Street movie theater in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, watching Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, with my dad. And I'm just like, this is the world in which I want to live. Um, it just drew me, you know? And uh, I had the good fortune to attend Hattiesburg High School, uh, which had an excellent drama program at the time under the direction of Michael Marks. And we toured all around the country to drama festivals and I had opportunities to perform uh, both with Hattiesburg high school and local community theater. And, um, I just knew that I, I had to do it. So, uh, I wound up at the North Carolina school of the arts. Now the university of North Carolina school of the arts with some amazing teachers. Uh, the Dean at the time was the late great Carol Friedman who has, who has left us, uh, very recently. Um, rest in peace, Gerald. Um, and, uh, that program really prepared me for just what it takes and how hard it is and how you, how you really have to dig down deep and search your soul and figure out exactly who the hell you are. If you really want to be an actor and you have to have thick skin rhinoceros hide, right? Because this business is tough and it's going to take you down and, it, there's a lot more rejection than, than there is success. But, uh, you know, New York, Los Angeles, um, getting little bites of the apple here and there, doing some cool sort of indie theater and, 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 and small time stuff. I, I was a stand in on Terminator three out in LA. Oh, and, that's cool. Um, that was a cool gig. And, and, uh, I spent one lovely afternoon chatting, uh, with Claire Danes, who was so wonderful to me at the time. I mean, I was, I was nobody. I was, a, like I say, I was a lowly stand in and we spent probably a good 40, 45 minutes chatting. I think that that was at Hollywood cemetery. I don't know if you remember Terminator three, it's mm -hmm. probably, you know, one of the more forgettable Terminator films, but there was a whole scene that takes place in the cemetery where Arnold shooting things up and, and, uh, spent a great afternoon there talking with Claire on set one day. Um, but mostly I worked in food service, you know, and, uh, I, you know, the closest I really got was catering the governor's ball of the Academy Awards for the catering company that I worked for. Um, but it didn't stop the passion that I had for the medium and, and for, you know, wanting to do this thing. Um, I started taking some classes at UCLA. I got into academia. I, I ultimately, uh, wound up uh, in New Orleans, um, getting a PhD at Tulane University in history. Ancient history has always, always been a passion of mine. And, uh, I always knew that, you know, this acting thing, you know, if you, if you love anything else in the world, you should probably be doing that instead of being in the entertainment industry, because it's, it's, it's tough. It's a tough slog. Um, so I found this thing being at UCLA, taking classes there, uh, and then I, I wound up in New Orleans right around the time of Hurricane Katrina. And then in the wake of that, all this production 
exploded in New Orleans. Right? And um, opportunities started sort of falling my way. Uh, I, I got some, some, some big gigs, some, some smaller indie gigs, and, but mostly I was sort of inspired again and, and dragged back uh, into this thing that had been my first passion to begin with. So um, I'm so grateful uh, to the city of New Orleans and, and the timing of that because I, I really had a, I wouldn't say I had left it behind, but I had sort of put it on the back burner. But what that time afforded me was really opportunity. And, and that is to say, I was able to go down this other path, this path, this academic path, which ultimately led me to where I am now. That is being a, a faculty member at Loyola, which is, you know, outside of actually being on a set, the greatest gig on the planet. Um, but it also gave me time to think and to reflect on who I am as an artist, something that I think a lot of people are doing right now. How badly uh, do I want this thing? Um, what does it really mean to me? Um, and then, and then maybe, maybe gave me a, a chance to reckon with the idea of living without it. Um, and you know, it's the old adage, it's the old saw, if you love something, set it free. If it comes back to you, it's yours. If it doesn't, it wasn't meant to be. And it really did. It really came back to me. And suddenly I look up and I'm doing a scene with Steve Zahn on Treme on, on HBO, you know? So, um, I just, had, you know, some of it was right place, right time sort of situation. Um, and, and then, you know, just seeing what was possible and, and, taking the bull by the horns and saying, Hey, uh, you can open this door for me or not, but I'm going to kick it in and, and starting to make my own films and being around some incredibly talented and creative people. And, uh, which basically brought me down the path that, that I'm traveling along now. It's like the a saying I heard recently, if you want the opportunity, you have to go out and get it. And that, right. and that's what right. you know yourself and a lot of a lot of indie filmmakers are doing. But um, well, the, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that. I mean, what what was fascinating to me is when I started making my own films, I, I started getting so many more opportunities and offers as an actor on other people's stuff. So I don't know if that's, you know, you just put out a certain energy into the universe or something. But when I stopped caring about, you know, somebody else saying, okay, you're worthy to be in my TV show or my movie or whatever, and, and started saying, you know what, I'm going to make my own stuff. All these other opportunities came along as well. So it, 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 it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. It, you know, I used to hear when I was a younger actor that casting directors can smell desperation. Um, and if you just if you just walk in the room like you don't give a shit, you know, suddenly the whole world opens. And I think that kind of happened for me in a lot of respects when I started making my own films, because suddenly I didn't necessarily need those other gigs because I knew whether I get this gig or not, I'm going to make my own movie. Well, I think when you do that, you mentioning you know, kind of the attitude of not giving a shit, I think that in a way kind of portrays a certain amount of confidence because if you don't yeah. care what other people think, then chances are you believe in what you're doing and confidence is infectious and people are drawn to it. So I, I think you're on to something whenever you say that. And, and you mentioning, you know, that certain energy, it's, it's that combination of, you know, I think hard work definitely does go into it, but it also takes, you know, some people call it luck. I also, I like to prefer to it as timing, where it's just like things have to be right place, right time in order for it right. to work. So I, it sounds like that's yeah. what happened with you. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're right there. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, before we get to the dinner party, we were talking about this off air. I have to ask you about this just because I've had him on my show uh, a couple of times. Talk to me about your experience on the set of Son of a Gun, directed by uh, writer, director, and former podcast guest of mine, Travis Mills. Uh, very positive experience. Um, uh, uh, you know, I had always wanted to do a Western. I, I don't know if I would call Son of a Gun a proper Western. Um, 
But uh, Travis and I had worked together on a short film called Handsome, which you can see even now on Amazon Video Direct, and I hope your listeners will check it out, um, which Travis wrote and I directed. And, you know, we had been talking about possibly doing something together uh, for a while, and then this opportunity came up, and um, it was... It was, it was at a time where it was going to be difficult for me to commit to Travis's movie for a big, long swath of, of time. So he had this idea to split these stories of this Legrand character into three parts, which would reduce my commitment on the project and allow him to sort of tell the story from three different potential perspectives and to leave the audience wondering, okay, what, what actually happened here, which I think is a really interesting approach to this, this particular storyline about the, you know, the, the magic bullet that may have impregnated this young lady. Um, and then at the same time, he decided to cast, uh, Lindsay Ann Williams, my, my partner in life and art. Uh, so we got a chance to work together in this one, version of the story which was really cool uh and and we had a terrific time um and uh, as i mentioned in the uh in our discussion before the show you know travis and i have another project that we're trying to get planned and and, and you know our if schedule permitting we had a, we had originally planned to shoot it in june in arizona and COVID is throwing a monkey wrench in that but um, I'm very much looking forward to working with him again if the opportunity works out. Yeah, you mentioning the the three viewpoints of, of one story. To me, that's what makes that story very unique because you don't see too many movies that are like that. And it causes what I consider pure movie fandom, and that is when audiences, your friends, whatever the case may be, when they see a movie, they spend time talking about, okay, what really happened? What happened next? Where, right. where, where do the characters go from here? And that's, that's one of the reasons why I think filmmaking is the greatest form of, of art and storytelling. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm blown away by great paintings, by sculptures. But to me, the art of performing and the art of filmmaking, to me, are, is the greatest art form that's out there. And it's, that's one of the many reasons why. You know, and I... I it, and the thing that is so interesting about that, that you, you point to that as one of the, the, the major perks, the, one of the big successes of that narrative, of that film. And I don't want to speak for Travis, but, you know, I think Travis would say that that was born out of necessity. It was born out of the inability to find one of the actors that he really wanted to play that role, you know, throughout the entire narrative. Um, the, the inability to work the schedules out and, you know, which is something that we all face right in this business. Um, so we had to come up with another way of telling the story. And I think it was an incredibly unique and inventive and creative way of telling the story, which probably wound up being a lot better than his original plan, right? Kind of like, the, you know, the sharp POV in Jaws, right? That wasn't the plan. Mm -hmm. It's just that the mechanical shark never worked. But wow, the shark POV is so much better than seeing the mechanical shark. So I, I think that you know pe people who really have that creative gene are able to use setbacks like that, or, or use obstacles, and to turn them around and, and to create something really special and maybe something even better than they had originally envisioned. And that's the beauty of filmmaking, too, is sometimes, and to use a, a Bob Ross quote, it's almost like a happy accident. In a way, like with right. you mentioning Jaws, I can't picture that movie without the shark POV. I, I absolutely no, it can't. It's not the same movie. It doesn't it's work. Not the, it's not the same movie without the shark POV. I mean, the 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 mechanical shark not working saved Jaws. I mean, it, it, it's a great film in terms of you know brilliantly written and characters, brilliantly acted. I mean, Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfuss, Roy Schneider. Um, but the shark POV is that movie. Mm -hmm. It's the heart and soul of the movie. It wouldn't have existed if the mechanical shark worked. Absolutely. 
So let's talk about uh, your upcoming film, The Dinner Party. What was the inspiration behind you making this film, and how was your experience doing it? So uh, one of our producers on this film, Jim Boolean, brought me this script. Uh, Michael Donovan Horn had, had written. Uh, and foundationally, I found it to be very interesting. And at, at its core, it had this idea, which was that people who had been abused or had suffered trauma uh, as a major part of their condition, you know, as growing up, their evolution as a human being wound up being abusive themselves, wound up as a way to, as a coping mechanism uh, for that abuse. That, that they were taught that, 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 that love and abuse were synonymous in some way. Um, and I just thought that was fascinating from a psychoanalytical perspective. Um, that, that germ. And we, we did a lot of work on the script and we wrote it and we rewrote it. And we added characters and we took characters away and we added spooky religious elements. Um, but at the end of the day, I thought, I thought that was the germ that was most, most interesting and most important. That and what, what it ultimately became, which was this kind of uh, female forward, bit of social commentary and, and satire. Um, that that said a lot about you know the current state of things in in our country and the vast divide between those who have and those who don't, uh, which obviously is something that has uh, been brought to the fore with COVID as well. Um, but anyway, I, I, I love the rogues gallery element of the film. I love the fact that you had all these colorful and complicated and troubled and terrifying characters put together in the same room in the same space um and you know what was going to happen i I, it was i I love the fact that the film um had this 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 veneer of the of the you know the opera and and this sort of upper crust elitist these people uh you know they don't know they're bad guys they're just they're living their lives how they've been conditioned to live them. And, um, and I just, there were, there were just a lot of interesting ideas at play there. Um, so I saw an opportunity and, and so I sort of took that and these sort of hoity toity cultural elite opera aficionados, arts aficionados, and tried to take that to the next level in terms of the design and the visual aesthetic of the film. And we, we talked with the department heads early on with Michael Williams, the DP, and Julie Tosh, the production designer, Lindsay, who designed costumes for this, um, that we wanted this really Baroque vibe. We wanted it to feel uh, like, a, like a Caravaggio painting or a Ribera painting, you know, in its, in its look. We probably talked more and planned more and plotted more about this film, the look of this film in particular, than anything that, that I've done so far. Um, spent more time thinking about the meticulous details. Um, and, you know, for, for all those reasons, I mean, I'm an artsy-fartsy guy myself. You know, I think a lot about art and literature and music and paintings and whatever. Uh, so it just provided a lot of opportunity. And it was different, really, than anything that I'd ever done. It was a script. It was the first script that I'd done as a feature that I didn't write from the ground up. Um, so that was attractive to me. That was a, a point of excitement and infatuation for me. I was like, okay, let me take this story. Let me take this, this kernel, this foundation and see what I can build. Um, and, uh, and, and then because of the, the, how every one of these characters is important and every one of these characters plays a significant role in the story. Everyone certainly sitting around that dinner table casting was supremely important. And, you know, we were fortunate to get, get some amazing actors, including Bill Sage and so Wandy Wilson and, and, you know, my old buddy, Mike Mayhall and Allie Hart, who is, you know, not a household name as yet, but I, I sure hope she will be because she's incredibly magnetic and talented and special. And many thanks to Rachel Sheedy, her agent, 
uh, who's also Bill Sage's agent, Bill Sadler, who I've worked with on a couple of other things, who recommended her to us. Um, uh, Jeremy London's in the film in a small but pivotal role. Richie Montgomery, who I've, I've worked with uh, a couple times now. Camille McEwen. Um, so all of that, all of those elements coming into play and, and, and coming together to create something that I thought was, had a lot of potential and was really interesting and dark and twisty and weird and had a little something to say maybe that was useful or positive, um, just drew me to the project and, and, and into this crazy wacky world. And hopefully we came up with something that, that is unique and special and interesting. It's interesting because like the horror and like dark genres aren't typically my favorite, though I've opened up to them, you know, in the last couple of years. But you describing it to me and you mentioning because this is one of my favorite aspects of film when it's done correctly is the ensemble cast that you mentioned before right. of having a collection of characters that all play off each other, but they're all important. And, you know, there might be, you know, one who stands out from the other, but it wouldn't work as well if you didn't have those characters and those actors together. And that's something that, you know, I don't know if you ever saw Knives Out, but um, that, that movie was that way as far as, you know, like the, the murder mystery, like all the characters have a purpose and they are necessary in a way, so... Uh, you you definitely sold me on it. I'm I'm excited to to see how it turns out. Yeah, this this the, this film is sort of a kindred to that in a lot of ways, right? It, it, you know, every character has a purpose. Every character is representative of some big theme or big emotion or big idea um, or big narrative moment, and and so. I, I hope we achieve that in this film. And I, I would say the same is, is true of, of that movie as well. And, and is there a release date for the dinner party? And will it be available for people to check it out? Yes. So uh, we are releasing on June 5th on all of the major streaming platforms. So you can find it on iTunes or Amazon, um, Google Play, you know, the usual suspects. Um you can also find it on your cable on-demand menu. So whether you're with Comcast or Cox or Time Warner or whatever, check your on-demand menu and you should be able to find it there. We had initially atten- intended a theatrical release for the film, but uh, you know, COVID blew a hole in that. Uh, we are still exploring some possibilities and some way to do some some kind of theatrical release, whether that's at the drive-in or uh, whether it's sort of a something that we do down the line do some theatrical events once uh, we are past the pandemic. But uh, right now we, you know, we thought it's important to get the film out there. People are, people are hungry, hungry for content right now. I know that uh, during this stay at home order in here in new Orleans, where, where we live uh, movies have been a great uh, salve to me. They've been a great comfort and, and television shows uh, and I just think we are at a time where art is as important as ever and artists are as important as ever. And, you know, obviously, you know, our, our frontline healthcare workers, our medical professionals, our scientists, our health experts uh, who are leading us and should be guiding us through this and who are putting our, our country and our, our, health on their backs and, and pulling us through are first and foremost in our minds and in our hearts right now. But, you know, while all, while everybody's sitting at home, what are they doing? They're watching movies. They're watching television. They're consuming art. They're listening to music, right? They're reading books. Uh, we never, never underestimate the power of art in the most difficult and traumatic and trying and complicated times. Um, Artists have a voice. Artists are truth tellers and artists entertain us and make us laugh and make us cry and make us think. And so um, we thought it was important to just go ahead and get the film out there, whether there's a theatrical release or not, and and let the public consume it and enjoy it. And and, uh, we hope they'll like it. I don't think I could have said any of that any better myself. 
That was very, very well said. But um, as we start Thank to wrap, you. as we start to wrap up here, I always like to to end the interviews with this. But what advice could you give to someone who's an aspiring, whether it's you know actor, director, writer, anyone who wants to work in the film industry? What's one piece of advice that you would give to them? Uh, I would say that you own the reins to your own destiny, and whether or not someone allows you in the door or allows you on the set of their film or their television show, you have the ability to create art. You have the ability to showcase what you do, whether that's as an actor, whether that's as a writer, whether that's as a director, you have the ability to create it and put it out there. And I don't care whether that's on Amazon video direct or YouTube or Vimeo or whatever it is. If you have this thing burning in your soul that you feel you have to do, if you have this story that you have to tell, you have the ability to tell it. Everybody has an iPhone or a Galaxy or some form of of video device that they carry around in their pocket or in their hand all day long, every day, probably to their own detriment. (laughs) You have the ability. (laughs) You have the ability to tell your story. Um, and if you, if you beat on the door long enough and you tell that story and you say, Hey world, this is me. This is my voice. This is who I am. This is the narrative that I'm trying to tell. Eventually, probably somebody will listen. Somebody will pay attention. Um, and I, I, I tell you, I've done a lot of, at this point, I've done a lot of big time stuff, big time shows, movies and stuff. But that didn't really happen for me until I took that mentality that whether or not someone else lets me in their door, I'm going to open my own door and start telling my story. And, uh, you know, I think that if more artists took that kind of mentality, especially now, I mean, look at what's going on now. Look at all of the artists who are posting on Instagram, posting on Facebook, Twitter, whatever it might be, right? And, uh, you know, whether you're whatever, Derek or Chris Martin from Coldplay, what what are you doing? You're posting on Instagram. Uh, you know, that, so we really have reached a sort of leveling of the playing field. Uh, so now more than ever, maybe is an opportunity for artists to really get their vision and their voices out there. And so I would say, do it. There's no time like the present. And if that doesn't get you fired up to make a film, I don't know what will. Uh, Last thing I want (laughs) to ask you real quick before I let you go, do you have any website or social media you'd like to plug so the listeners can follow you? Yeah, you can follow me at, at Miles underscore Doliak on in Instagram and uh, Twitter, uh, which is where I post most of my movie-related stuff and occasionally some other random thoughts on things that are important to me. Uh, lots of pictures of my dogs and me drinking. But, uh, but you know, other, other good movie-related stuff as well. So um, I would say that's the best place to, to give me a follow. Um, and uh, a- anything that is uh, dinner party related, also follow at Uncorked Ent on um, Twitter and Instagram. That, that is our distributor. And Keith Leopard has been so good to us over the past few years distributing uh, the last four films. Uh, just a great fan of independent filmmakers and somebody who understands and appreciates and embraces the creative vision of independent filmmakers. Uh, so give Keith a follow at, at Uncorked and so that's Uncorked without the E um, on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, you should you should be able to find out what you need to know about how to watch our movie and and then you know watch our films. And and the only thing I ask if you watch our movie, we're grateful. We're grateful you watched it. But if you liked it, even a little bit. Even, even the tiniest little bit, say something nice about it on the platform, whether that's on Amazon or iTunes or Google Play or, or Steam or VHX or whatever it might be. Just, just say, really enjoyed this movie or um, great cinematography or 
good acting or can be very brief because those sorts of things really make a difference. I think that's what a lot of users, user who people who write user reviews don't really get. Those things make a difference. People read them and, you know, a lot of folks will, you know, have this perception that, uh, Every movie has hundreds of millions of dollars at its disposal. And the fact of the matter is very few movies have that kind of money uh, at their disposal. A lot of us are just, we are trying to make quality content, quality films with not nearly enough money and not nearly enough time. Uh, so when we, when we remotely succeed in creating something of worth, it's, it, it's really great if somebody comes out and just says, hey, it's pretty dang good. Uh, and people read those user reviews. So if you watch our movie and you like it, say something nice about it on, on some public forum, social media, IMDb, whatever it might be. It would mean a great deal to us. Absolutely. Well, sir, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview and the opportunity to talk to you. And I look forward to seeing what comes up for you in the future. Hey, man, it's been my pleasure. Shoot me a link when uh, the interview's ready to go. Thanks again to Miles Doliak for coming on the show to have that awesome conversation. Be sure to follow him on social media and check out The Dinner Party, available on all streaming platforms. For next week's show, we're going to be doing another Facebook Live show. Um, for those who have been watching my morning show, The Daily Diamond, you know that this week that show is coming to an end. But it will live on uh, when I occasionally do top ten lists on the show and we'll be doing another top 10 list next week with top 10 villains in film which should be a lot of fun because I love villain characters I love what makes them tick why they become the way they are so it's going to be a really fun discussion that's going to be this Sunday night at 8 p.m. central time on Facebook live at facebook.com slash d diamond podcast and I mentioned in the intro that there are going to be some slight tweaks to the podcast. No real major changes, but the, the episodes that you've been seeing over the last several months that include an interview and a review segment, or say like a top 10 list or whatever I do on Facebook Live, those hybrid episodes will be no more. So if I have an interview lined up, then the interview will take up the duration of the show. If I do a Facebook Live segment or I have a roundtable discussion about a film franchise or just a particular movie, that will be the duration of that episode. So no more hybrid shows. Uh, to be perfectly honest, the more I've done them, uh, the more I don't like them, and I feel like one kind of takes away from the other. So I, I want to give, when I have guests on, I want to give them as much time as possible to promote their stuff and talk about their career, Likewise, if I bring friends on to talk about a movie or a franchise, we have as much time as possible to have that discussion. So that will go into effect uh, starting this week, uh, as you've heard uh, the interview with Miles, and next week we'll be doing a Facebook Live show uh, with a top 10 list. So uh, nothing really major other than that. That's just something that has been kind of weighing on my mind the last couple of weeks. So that change will go into effect with today's episode. But if you want to check out past episodes of the Derek Diamond Experience, you can check them out on all podcasting platforms as well as YouTube. Just search for the Derek Diamond Experience. And if you could, leave me a review. Uh, the more reviews I get, the more visible I become to the podcasting public. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at D Diamond Podcast. And of course, thank you to my close friends, the Unicorn Wranglers, for providing the theme music for the podcast. You can check out all their music on Apple Music, Google Play, and Spotify. And that's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you once again to Miles Doliak, and thank you guys for checking out the show. Enjoy the rest of your week. Have a safe and fun weekend. Thank you for tuning in to another awesome episode of the Derek Diamond Experience. I am your host, Derek Diamond, and we'll see you guys back here this Sunday on Facebook Live. <laughs>